In this video, we introduce the index of refraction for light traveling within a material. Then we introduce the idea of refraction and we work a couple refraction examples. So when light enters a material, the effective speed of the light changes. And when I say effective speed, I'm trying to emphasize that the speed of light is still the same old constant, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. But in a material, the light is constantly interacting with the molecules in the material, which then re-radiate the light and this effectively slows the propagation of the wave. We talk about the change in speed by introducing the idea of the index of refraction for the material. The index of refraction just quantifies how much the speed slows down, and that's n equals c over v. So written this way, I can see that when v gets smaller, n gets bigger. So like if v was half the speed of light in the vacuum, the index of refraction would be 2. So let's work a quick example with index of refraction. I want the speed of light in water given that its index of refraction is 1.33. So we're just going to take our index of refraction formula and solve it for V. And I plug in C, the speed of light in a vacuum, and divide by 1.33. And when I do this, I get 2.26 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So one effect of the change in speed is that light will bend when it changes from one medium to another. And this is called refraction. So on the right hand side we have two pictures of different refractions the first one has a light ray entering a slower material and the second one has the light ray exiting the slower material moving into a faster material so the real answer for why this bending occurs comes from applying boundary conditions to a differential equation that describes the light wave but here we're just trying to physically motivate the qualitative behavior that we're seeing and so what we do is we visualize these wave fronts that's the little white line segments representing crests on the light wave that's going in the direction the ray is pointing. And we can see in this first picture where I have this light ray moving from a faster material to a slower material, that this wave crest right at the boundary, well, the bottom edge of that is entering the slower material before the top edge of that. That means this part of the wave front slows down while this part keeps moving quickly at the top. And effectively, this causes a rotation of the wave front. So by the time all these wave fronts pass into this lower material, they've all been tilted to a more extreme angle, and we see the refraction of the ray toward the normal line. In other words, my refracted angle is smaller than my incident angle. There's the incident, there's the refracted. In the second picture, we use a similar sort of physical motivation. I have wave fronts in the slower material, and it's approaching this interface where the waves switch to a faster material. Well, at some point, this wave front that's right next to the interface is going to have the top edge pass into the faster medium, while the bottom edge is still moving slowly. And this amounts to a rotation clockwise of that wave front. And by the time that wave front emerges from the material, it's going to have this new direction where I can see my ray has been refracted away from the normal. So in this case, the refracted angle is going to be bigger than the incident angle. So this physical reasoning is at least a good mnemonic device for remembering which way things are going to refract. And one more thing I want to put on this slide is Snell's Law, which quantifies how much these light rays are going to refract. So Snell's Law. When you have a transition from one medium to the next, this is how the indices of refraction and the incident and refracted angles are related. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. So let's take a look at how to apply Snell's Law. In this first example, I have a fast to slow transition, and I see the ray bending toward the normal. So this is a ray transitioning from air to water with an incident angle of 35 degrees. Now, the effective speed of light in air actually is a little bit slower than it is in a vacuum. It's like 1.0003. But to the degree of precision we normally work, we're just going to say it's approximately 1. Then we already saw water. That's 1.33. And my incident angle, I'm going to call this theta 1, is 35 degrees. And then we're trying to solve for the refracted angle. So we apply Snell's law. N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. And N1 is 1. Theta 1 is 35 degrees. N2 is 1.33. And theta 2 is unknown. And I'm going to go ahead and call it theta r for refracted angle. So we divide by 1.33. And then we take the inverse sine. And we'll have our angle. And to three sig figs, we get 25 and a half degrees. So again, that's going to be smaller than the incident angle, which is another way of saying the ray has bent closer to the normal. 
So in the second example, you might notice that I just made a couple of corrections. That incident angle was actually too big to get a refraction coming out of the crown glass, and that ray would have undergone total internal reflection. And I'll post a link to that. That's the next video I'm making today. So I changed the angle to 38 degrees so that I would get a refracted angle less than 90. And we're going to call the crown glass material number 1, and n is 1.52 in crown glass and I have a ray transitioning from inside the glass to outside so I see it bending away from the normal that'll be material number two that's the air where again we're going to say the index of refraction is approximately one and we apply Snell's law and all we have to do is take the inverse sine of 1.52 sine 38 we've got the refracted angle and this turns out to be 69.4 degrees if you find the physics content on Zach's Lab helpful, click on the Zach's Lab logo on the right to browse playlists and subscribe to the channel. I produce over 100 new videos per month, and subscribing is the easiest way to find new content. Thanks for watching.